I'm Sian, one of the project team, and I'd like to invite to the stage Tony Pinchin and Mary Hepburn and Candy Duggan. I'm feeling a bit like uh, Graham Norton at the moment. Ah. <laughs> This is just an informal last session for the project um, for today. <laughs> Written something in advance. Um, I'd like to welcome um, the three of them to the stage, but anybody could have been invited here today. The reason that we actually asked Tony, uh, Mary and Candy was because they represent the geographical spread that we were hoping to get and also different professions. So I'm just going to uh, briefly talk with all three of them, all of who were interviewed for the project. First of all, can I ask each of you, uh, one by one, maybe to just give an overview for the audience of your area of work in the 18, 18, 1980s and 90s? <laughs> Not that old. <laughs> Um, okay, I, I was a clinical immunologist, a, a doctor, a teacher, a researcher, uh, later became very much involved in public policy work and, and some media work of necessity. Um, but as my father kept reminding me, uh, which came up in the interviews, um, basically, I was a doctor. Is working, is it? Yes. In, in the 80s, uh, I arrived in Glasgow in 1980 as a junior obstetrician and got involved with developing services for socially disadvantaged women. So uh, the nature of the HIV epidemic in Scotland meant that all of those who were infected were going to be my patients. So that was how I became involved with them and finally got funding through HIV to set up a health inequalities service in, in, at the end of that decade. Thanks. Um, I'm a paediatric nurse, <laughs> and uh, uh, Great Ormond Street um, were advertising for a paediatric nurse who had experience in counselling to work with families affected by HIV, and there were two main families um, affected at that time, and those were the boys with haemophilia um, who'd received infected blood products, and also that we had many babies who were being admitted to the intensive care unit with what we then found was pneumocystis pneumonia. So um, I applied and got the job, and, <laughs> and the rest is history. <laughs> So can I ask all three of you, um, maybe uh, carry on, um, Candy, because you've got the microphone. We've already talked about the themes that have come out from all the interviews. Your memories, when you reflect back, what were the most challenging aspects of the work you were involved in? Um, I've been thinking about it a lot, really, because I think the main challenge was, as a paediatric nurse, was, and we've all said it many times, um, it, it's the, the sort of rights of the child and not wanting to lie to children and to tell children the truth, but also respecting the parents' wishes and for the, the family, well, the, for the children not to know their diagnosis. So that was a main challenge for us. And, you know, I remember one of the um, fathers saying to me, the classic, you know, with all due respect, Candy, <laughs> you are not telling my child that they have HIV because they will be dead. There is no need to tell them, um, and we would have to work from there and talk about how um, we could prepare children and their families for increasing in health, well, ill health, and that roller coaster really that um, a lot of um, patients went through at the time. So that was one of our main challenges, really. Well, I guess looking after people who are socially disadvantaged is challenging anyway. Um, and for many of these women, a lot of them who were injecting drug users, being diagnosed as HIV positive was just literally the last straw. And then in later years, when more of the patients were asylum seekers and refugees, uh, they, weren't, they were subjected to lots of judgmental treatment. And I think the biggest challenge was always trying to ensure that these people weren't given judgmental care because they so often did and trying to make sure that they got 
good professional care despite all these other issues. And uh, yeah, that was pretty challenging. Um, so many challenges. Um, I mean, I think everything comes, came for me back to, as I said earlier, my role as a, as a, as a clinician working with uh, patients and everything flowed from that. And I think uh, I remember particularly at very early patients almost literally, certainly metaphorically, telling me, I am telling you all of this so you can go out and use it. Uh, and there was a real sense of responsibility and privilege, that word came up, I think, in the interviews a lot, that we had been given that duty by people who were dying literally in front of our eyes, that they were extraordinarily open with us, um, not just for their own health care. They often said, I want you to make sure this isn't happening to other people that it doesn't need to happen to and and so but I, in a way that's not a challenge in a negative sense I felt that was a very positive challenge and it motivated the sense of uh, vocation slightly old-fashioned word but um, not, I'm not afraid of it because um, I think vocation brought a lot of us into this field um, a real sense of something beyond just the professional technical skills um, but I think thinking uh, and, and I suppose the proximity that we had uh, necessarily with patients, with the communities affected, with our colleagues, was crucial and important and made a difference. And yet, we had to learn how to find a boundary so we didn't find ourselves the wrong side of the bridge um, when things uh, went, went sour one way or another. And learning how to use and value that proximity, but also to retain sufficient distance to be effective. Um, and probably the area which was most challenging, which was a representation of that in a way, clearly we had to use the media um, uh, very widely to ensure the message went out, uh, to take forward the campaign that Lord Fowler mentioned about and so on, uh, and to make sure that some of the misinformation was, all, so was corrected and so on. But the proximity with the media was the hardest thing because they always wanted the personal stories and protecting patient confidentiality, protecting those very individuals who had given their stories to use as information but not to abuse uh, as, as personal voyeuristic stories. Observing that balance and managing that boundary was the most challenging um, and remains always an issue for health professionals. Well, let's move on to the rewarding, because everybody's been in it a long time. So, why? Why did you stay? What was rewarding about this area of work for you? Well, it, it flows from what I just said. I mean, um, at heart, uh, I, I, ever since I wanted to be a train driver, I wanted to be a doctor. <laughs> um, and um, it, it nourished my vocation as a doctor, working with people in such a very special way, uh, such an open and straightforward way. Um, and I learned so much from patients, not about, not just about the illness and the, defect, the way it affected them, but about human beings. And I think the thing that was probably most nourishing was watching and witnessing people who, despite having an AIDS diagnosis and therefore at that time, average nine month life expectancy or whatever, taking on new things, new things they'd always wanted to do, living above themselves. I remember one particular patient who said, who was a, happened to be a Roman Catholic, he said, I want to go and see the Holy Father and tell him what it's about. And he did. Uh, maybe taking a little while for it to ripple through, but it, he got there. <laughs> Um, another patient who said, oh, I had been planning to set up a new um, artistic company of some sort, um, and now I can't do it. And I said, why not? I said, you know, this is an episodic illness, and when you're over this thing, why not? And he did. And it was going, going really well three years later when he died. And it was watching that, what uh, Jeremiah Hopkins called the sheer achieve of it. And I thought that was... That was a wonderful privilege to witness, and if we could help by managing the disease so they could be the people that they wanted to be, great. 
Well, I, I got involved in this area of healthcare because the socially disadvantaged women didn't engage with services. And so we wanted to develop a service that they would use. I was always told by my colleagues, my senior colleagues, that it was their fault and they were irresponsible. And if healthcare services were there and they chose not to use them, then that's their own stupid fault. And we were able to demonstrate that actually, if you listen to people and you work with them and you develop a service that meets their needs, they will engage. And so we ended up with the same booking gestation as the rest of the obstetric services. And so that's how, with, that's for all of the women, not just the women with HIV. And so it was immensely satisfying to be able to show that if we provided a proper non-judgmental service that people would come. Um, and quite often, but the problem was we were almost too successful and we discovered that the women would be coming back pregnant a few months after they delivered because they said that their experience during their pregnancy was the most positive experience they'd ever had. <laughs> <laughs> and so that was when we thought, well, we better start providing a service that, looking at contraception as well, <laughs> <laughs> which was not seen as our responsibility, but we did. So we said to the women, you can, you can come even if you're not pregnant, we're delighted to see you. And quite often though, there were sadly bad outcomes, socially as well as medically, and a lot of the women ultimately lost custody of their children. And they used to come along to see me to say thank you very much and thank the team for having looked after them and to tell us that it hadn't gone well. And then we would hear a few weeks later that they died. And mostly it was a sort of version of suicide, although it was, it was always put down as, a, as an accidental overdose. So, it, but it was also very sad, you know, as when, we, when we were looking after women with HIV and as they began to die. But I do remember so vividly being asked by one of their self-help groups to go and do a session on contraception uh, at one of their days. And several of them came up to me to say afterwards, thank you very much, and we probably won't see you again because we're not going to survive, uh, but we wanted to say thank you very much. And about six months later, a whole group of them came to my clinic and said, bet you never thought you'd see us again. <laughs> <laughs> and that was when they, the, the treatment began. And so, latterly, it became very, very satisfying to see that we could give them good health care, and then once treatment became available, that we could actually help these women to have uh, healthy, uninfected babies, and that they could go home with them and have meaningful family lives together. So, it, it, I mean, it's rewarding on so many fronts that you know, it was always good. Thanks. Yeah, very similar, really. Um, I mean, I think one of the most rewarding things that's been said already in that the lack of pomposity and the help and the genuine, um, like, real drive to, uh, for healthcare professionals, um, drug companies, um, volunteers, uh, advocates, to all work together. And I think that coming in as a pediatric nurse, I was really quite frightened about how I would uh, be received by then mostly the gay community. And it's like, as we said already about Princess Di, it was like, um, you know, I remember somebody at Terence Higgins Trust saying to me when I first went to do the Terence Higgins Trust AIDS counselling course, which did involve describing my genitalia, I have to say. <laughs> and they said at that time, you know, if, if you know, if if, if people can hug a baby with AIDS, then actually that's fine with us. You know, mm -hmm. it will change attitudes. So that actually what was very rewarding was the, um, the willingness, I think, to work slightly outside the box and all and everybody working together. And that was a cross. So coming to Glasgow in the early days, to Edinburgh in the early days, everybody was so willing to share their, uh, the information they had, the experiences they had, and to actually put patients also in touch. Because again, for a lot of um, asylum seekers who were then moved away from London um, out into other areas of the country, then we were always wanting to be in contact with um, healthcare professionals and um, voluntary agencies in those areas who could support them. And the other rewarding thing is exactly that. It's the when treatment finally, you know, was effective, then though seeing those young people grow up um, and uh, achieving whatever um, 
I suppose, was their heart's desire that uh, that was phenomenal. And for their parents, for their families, for their friends, um, and obviously for themselves. And now seeing those young people who are still on antiretroviral treatment, who were part of the first Zidovidin trials and pharmacokinetics that we used to do, um, who are still you know, living and thriving with HIV today. So that's the reward. Can I ask you about this project? You're, you're obviously involved in the project. Mary, maybe I can start with you and just, as the project as a whole, and you've heard about being, it's now in the British Library, just wondering how you feel about the project as part of the 61 people who were involved. I think it's a fantastic idea because I'm sure that all of us who were involved right from the very beginning, um, it, it's been such an incredible journey. and. There have been so as many as, as as well as the negatives. There were lots and lots of positives, and again, privilege comes into it. I mean, what a privilege to meet so many wonderful people, both among the service users and the service providers, uh, which many of our colleagues never ever had an opportunity to, to do. And I always felt how incredibly lucky we were to be living through this. How no matter how depressing it was in the early days, or potentially depressing. Um, and I think it, it's such, it, it can't be a common thing in healthcare. I think this has, is a pretty unique experience. Um, well, no, maybe not unique, but it's, it's, it's certainly, it's, it's a fantastic experience. And I think it's really valuable to have recorded uh, that. And it made us all think back to what it was like, because you forget quite a lot of it. And actually going back to the beginning and remembering, I think is, yeah, it was very important. And Candy, for you, so your interview is sitting alongside Florence Nightingale. <laughs> <laughs> There's researchers who are going to access these interviews for all sorts of reasons. How does that feel? Um, a bit scary. Um, I, I look back and I think I was looking at my, there's a little piece up there or something that I said and I thought, oh goodness, you know, couldn't they have corrected my grammar? Couldn't they have, <laughs> you know, this is dreadful. <laughs> Um, and then I was told, no, 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 nothing could be changed. And so I was sort of a bit scared, really, about what I might have said that I actually hadn't listened back to. But nevertheless, I think it's important. And I think it was something that you said, um, Tony, a long time ago, um, which was about recording the histories of, if you like, the defeated. It's always the history of the... The, the, the winners, if you like, um, that seems to be recorded and actually that it's important to have those stories both from, you know, the people who were working at the time but also who were um, living and dying through, through that time. So I think it's an important history to, uh, to archive. And Tony, you're a high-profile public figure and on the news and always talking. Was this the same? Was this different? Doing an oral history project of this? Always talking. I was probably the nine-hour one. Um, <laughs> uh, it was different. Um, I mean, I love going to the British Library. I wasn't, hadn't been planning to stay there. <laughs> but uh, but uh, seriously... It, it, this was different, and I think it was was very helpful. I mean, I think you know, it was Aristotle or one of those geezers said that the unreflected life isn't worth living. And, and you know, since since retirement, I'm still a doctor being, but I'm not a doctor doing. Uh, since retirement, I've I've been reflecting on a lot of those things we witnessed and experienced, the, the very early days of which we've spoken and in the later years when things were transformed uh, in an extraordinary way. But we were, uh, as Mary said, uh, participating in, in an extraordinary period of history. Um, but something, you know, it was pretty frantic stuff. I mean, you know, we were home late and exhausted and then on to the next and people were dying and you're working through those upsets. And, um, and actually, you need some distance in time um, uh, to be able to reflect uh, in a worthwhile way on that. And I'm, I'm certainly still doing that through uh, sort of the arts and, and other ways. And this project, I think, was, was beautifully structured, and I'm not saying it because these folk are here, but, uh, but it, as a way of enabling that reflection to, to, to work in a way that was quite revelatory, um, I think particularly looking at antecedents, so talking about parents, grandparents, early life, 
I started, you know, there was sort of quite a lot of penny dropping moments when I realized actually what led me to be doing what I did and saying what I said and, uh, and feeling what I felt. And, and actually that, that, that was, that was it was, it was lovely, actually. Um, it, it sort of made sense of things that I hadn't, I hadn't put together. Um, so I think it, it, it was valuable in that sense, and I hope very much that in the trajectory of all of us that are recorded, that sense that we are, we are human beings participating in a piece of history, but it's the human qualities that, that must come through, both of the people we are caring for and the people we are working with. Um, and, I th and I think uh, oral history still sounds very, uh, very serious, uh, but actually uh, you know, it, felt, it felt above all very human and um, very rich for that. We're going to stop because after this session we're going to um, ask you all to carry on seeing each other, carry on chatting and talking about the old days um, over some drinks and canapes. Um, is there anything you would like to say before you finish that I haven't asked? And I'm going to ask Tony to tell a special story that I particularly love. But any other comments you needed to make before we finish? I can't think of it. Right, no, we're going straight into my favourite story. <laughs> One of the things about the interviews is that people did talk about their grandparents, their, their families, their background, their experience with, with their workplace. But over and over again, people kept telling these anecdotes, and we've got so many of them. Um, one of the favourites, um, and there are many of them, is one from Tony, and I asked him to finish today with that story. Thank you. Just before I say that, uh, while I was sitting earlier, I, I looked at the arch above, and um, I can't remember why it's there, but I have to say that that's a very good motto, to thyself, to thine own self be true. Uh, and actually, I think that's, that's what we're all about. Um, th this story that came up, and I quite, can't quite remember how, why or how Fiona managed to, to extract this from me, but that was one of the skills of the interview. Um, but I, by reason of confidentiality and, and a whole range of other reasons, um, the clinics I did were, were mixed clinics. So there were, uh, I did quite a lot of work with patients with CFSME, um, um, chronic fatigue syndrome, um, who had their own challenges and I suppose they're in stigmas and uh, yeah, some common issues there. Um, and they were, they, I would see them in the same clinic and so they'd be going through the same waiting rooms. Um, and um, there was this amazing, lovely occasion when uh, one of my patients, a middle-aged woman, who was, was an absolute delight and I'd been seeing her for probably six or seven years and you know, she got to the point where she knew how to manage her illness. I wasn't really telling her anything she didn't already know. So I said, well, look, you know, I think you know, we don't need to re make any regular uh, visits. You can always come back. And you know all you need to know, and you know what I'm going to say. And you know, uh, I'm here if, if you need me. And she, her face fell. And I said, no, I really mean that. And she said, no, 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 it's the boys. And I said, the boys? <laughs> and... Um, exploring a little further, it turned out that um, uh, she had formed this sort of network with a lot of the gay men with HIV who attended our clinic, and effectively there was another little clinic going on in the waiting room. <laughs> <laughs> and guy, the guys would sort of rearrange their appointments to fit around when she was she was coming to see me, um, and I realised that actually, you know, that <laughs> there's a lot goes on that's nothing about us. <laughs> There's so many lovely stories. Please feel free to get into the uh, website and hear some more, link into the British Library. Can I finally say, um, on behalf of myself and Jane and Nikki, thank you to all the people who were interviewed for this project. Thank you for all the volunteers, for all the support from the advisory committee, from the British Library, from Gilead. Um, we really, really appreciate it. And today's a really fabulous day for us. And thank you very, very much.